at the bottom of the screen as well for those who prefer captioning, interpreting. And interpreters will uh, remain on screen and will interpret anything, whether it's from ASL to English or English to ASL. I'm going to let the other panelists introduce themselves first, not the interpreters, of course. So Trish, I'll, I'll pass it off to you. Hello, my name is Trish Leakey. This is my name in ASL. Uh, I work with CLIP at the Colorado Commission. We work together and my role there is Auxiliary Services Manager. So I am responsible for providing interpreters for the court system um, and also in rural areas of the state of Colorado. So that's my position. I'm involved with interpreters and very uh, excited to discuss the certification issue this evening and to get your thoughts and ideas. Great. Uh, so Katie, I'll, I'll turn it over to you next. Hi, my name is Katie Q. This is my name in American Sign Language and I work with CCDHHDB on this particular project and really enjoyed the project. I'm looking forward to tonight's discussion. But, you know, we really do need to change your name because officially we should be calling you Dr. Katrina Q. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely, congratulations on that achievement. I used to it. <laughs> the commission contracted with uh, Dr. Q for this work. For Dr. Katrina, Dr. Katrina Q, we contracted with her. And we also then contracted with Dr. Henner. Dr. Henner? Hi, I'm John Henner. I'm a teacher at the University of North Carolina in Greensboro. And I work be with the Interpreter Preparation Program, I work with uh, Sign Language Assessment, and I've done that for several years now. Terrific. We're very happy to have you involved with this town hall, even if you are in North Carolina. I'm sure that uh, people are looking forward to working um, together on all of this. Now we are here tonight because the state of Colorado and the community, and the community in particular, has been asking the legislature to recognize other interpreter certifications. With that in mind, um, I should mention that, first of all, going back to 2009, the state legislature passed a statute, the Consumers Protection Law, and that uh, was in terms of interpreters' titles regarding deceptive trade practices. That law passed uh, very successfully after, well, I have to say almost 30 years of attempts at establishing licensure for interpreters. So it is the lowest level of regulation that is available for sign language interpreters. Um, so they list a number of them from licensure to certification, registration, consumer protection law is in that list, which means then now any professional who is a practitioner who works as an interpreter must carry certification, actually be certified and have that on them to verify they are a certified interpreter. If not, if they're not certified, they have to disclose that they are not certified and they have to call themselves something else, a communication facilitator, whatever you may feel is most appropriate. Because those people who are then hiring you for those services have to determine if they want your services. Now we are at 2020, from 20, 2009 to 2020, and a lot has changed in Colorado since then. A number of deaf people, quite a few actually, have moved to Colorado. And that means that uh, there is a greater need for qualified certified interpreters. That need has increased dramatically. And the pool of certified interpreters has seemed to diminish in terms of the demand. This has really become a huge challenge for all of us service providers in wanting to provide these services. And for those of us who are consumers needing those interpreting services and also for those who pay for interpreting services, it affects everyone in this system. It's been quite a challenge. The community has been talking about this quite some time and the talk has increased to the point where finally at some point the Independence Center in Colorado Springs 
decided to go ahead and take this up and brought it to the legislature. They brought a bill to the legislature to consider other interpreter certifications other than the RID certification. And the reason is because RID had put a moratorium on testing and that was for quite a few years and the delay was creating an issue for the pool of interpreters. The pool could not grow in Colorado uh, and that became an issue. So they worked with the Disabled Resources Services in Fort Collins and these two agencies worked together to bring this bill before the state legislature and it passed. That bill was HB 191069. Now in this bill, it empowers the commission to investigate and consider other interpreter certifications, to recognize other certifications and to accept them as used in the state of Colorado and that that would be considered valid and reliable certifications considered in our state. So the state legislature then provided some funds for research work to the commission to help us determine which certifications would be both valid and reliable um, or acceptable at least within the state of Colorado, whichever way it would turn. With that in mind, we contracted with, I will say, Katrina Q, Dr. Katrina Q, has, who has taken this work on. At that point, Katie, I will say, contracted with Dr. Henner, John, to work with us. I think at this point, I might turn it over to John for him to share his information with us. Uh, and this is Katie. Let's leave some time at the end for Q&A to our clip. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Katie. Yes. So um, hold, go ahead and send questions through the chat to Katie in the chat box throughout um, Dr. Henner's presentation. Absolutely. Sure, and I'll be able to answer those questions at the end. Uh, if people want to submit their questions, then yes, I'll address those at the end of my presentation. Okay, well, thank you for introducing me and for starting us off. Um, and I'm assuming that you all have the PowerPoint slides. And I've inserted the agenda in there. And basically, the agenda covers introductions, purpose, our methodology, descriptives. And then, let's see, some questions. Uh, as Cliff talked about the historical background, we'll talk about that and assessments and the research that was done and then conclusions from that research. So let's go back to talking about what the purpose of this is and how the project came about. As Cliff explained, the state's goal was to talk about the certification issue and how we could grow the pool of interpreters who have certification that was valid. So the question for me, um, I, as I mentioned, started doing assessments for uh, sign language um, several years ago when I was in Boston. Uh, I worked with Boston University doing assessments of American Sign Language there. And for many years I've traveled, studied, and published about this and had the opportunity to talk with people around the country. And in that work that I did, I also did some thinking about the research um, and how that we use more of a sociological approach. And by that, I mean, we look at someone and say, okay, that's a good signer. But how do you know that somebody is a good signer? Um, oh, they learned that sign from a book or they learned it from a book that was written by so-and-so and that's how they decide. 
but who's a part of that discussion in deciding qualifications and how do we show that? There has to be some sort of standard, you know? Um, it ha can't just be tied to a person. Uh, so those are some of the issues that we address. So that means that people who are not like that um, are then below the standard? Is that what that means? Does that mean that they don't sign well? They're not a good signer, so to speak? So those are the, some of the issues that we talked about, and I wrote about that and research about that. Um, and now when we talked about interpreter certification, I thought, you know, this is a great idea because for the last five years, there's been a lot of a discussion about this issue, about evaluating interpreters and about evaluating whether an interpreter is good. And how do we come up with specifics that show whether an interpreter is good or not? What is a good interpreter? I mean, let's be direct. If you ask somebody, what is a good interpreter? Well, they say it's somebody who signs well, but it's gotta be more than that. It has to be more than just the way they sign. Um, they sign well for who? You know, maybe one person thinks they're an awesome interpreter and another person would say, no, they're not. They're not a good interpreter. So the point is that we look at interpreters as being a good match for us or not a good match for us. So if there was somebody who learned sign language, for example, in the South, and then they went to California and signed in that way, how would people view them? Maybe the way that they sign or the signs that they use are different. It doesn't mean that they're bad. It just means that they're not a good fit for that particular, commu for that particular community. So there are several things that we take into consideration. And uh, we develop, what we develop for Colorado has to be something that fits the state as a whole. So I was asked to consider that and asked to think about, well, what is, the, what is appropriate? When we say something is valid, what does that really mean? It again depends. If I were to give a test, maybe a written test, would that be enough to just have a written test? So I'm really testing testing skills and reading skills. You know, but what if somebody answers that in a different way? So people say, well, that test then is not reliable. So they expect us to have the same goals. Like if every week people were tested, the results should be the same. And if they're the same over a two year period, then that would be great because the testers are spread out, they're dispersed well. Maybe we would have to change what interpreters learn more, maybe what they learn, maybe they become older or they forget what they learn. So it would have to be within a certain period of time that a person would have to be tested in order for that to be a beneficial approach. So when we think about assessments, we have to have the strength there in how we assess people, how we assess the individual. And we can do that by being computer-based, and that takes out the uh, subjectivity. You know, because sometimes it's easy. If you have somebody there, um, maybe they're there typing the test and the test is not standard. Maybe one week I look at the test and everything is turning out well. Then the second week I look at the results and I'm thinking, hmm, I start questioning myself. Uh, as to whether I'm seeing things right or not seeing things right, as to whether I've forgotten or not. So that happens with sign language assessment as well. If we pull a group of people together, and uh, the idea is that society itself uh, is supported based on whether it's sustainable. But one problem that we see with this is that there are disagreements. And when there are disagreements, then what can you do? If somebody says, oh, this is good. And somebody says, no, it's not. And the other person says, mm, it's mediocre. How do we evaluate that? How do we evaluate what is a bad interpreter and a good interpreter? Because what's good for me can be bad for them, right? Uh, so the three of us had a long and hard discussion about exactly what the point was of assessment. And then we came up with something that points that we agreed on. We assume that seven, well, I would say 70 to 80% agreement, or 66% agreement. So as time went on, maybe there would be better agreement in those scores. And then hopefully the test would be something that we could depend on. It would be reliable. 
that we would know that we were good judges of interpreting skills. So the point is, is that we are really practicing or assessing someone's knowledge and their ability to internalize that knowledge and their ability to apply that knowledge. So it's a challenge. It's a challenge for us. And if I could give an example, if I was very strict and said, well, I think that when you form an E in American Sign Language, it should look like this and not that. And then I critique them for the way that they form their E in American Sign Language. And I say, that's wrong. No, we have natural variation in the way that our hands form letters of the alphabet in American Sign Language. So that wouldn't be realistic. Um, that would be a conflicting point in the evaluation. So again, we have to think about that diversity and the challenge that we have with the way that people sign. So if the three of us are working together and maybe after one, two, three years, we get really good at evaluating people and assessing people. And then I say, okay, it's my turn. Um, and a new person comes on board. So now that reliability that we had with three of us doing assessment, we have to start all over again, building confidence, building that reliability, building validity. Um, we can't just go ahead and evaluate if we don't have that inter reliability. If we're not thinking on the same plane um, as a group doing this evaluation. So perhaps you have an old team and a new team and the way that they evaluate is not quite the same. We're not sure it's exactly the same. Um, so that's some of the things that I researched is the fact that there can be bias in the way that evaluation is done. For example, um, who do we bring? Like for example, if you're thinking about music, somebody listens to a song and they think, oh, this is great, let's hire that person. We find out that most new musicians are men. Why is that? Um, is not that men naturally have this um, talent for music. Why is that? So again, we have to test and experiment and evaluate. So you have this group and maybe they're the old original team doing their best assessment and they bring in men musicians. And then you have a newer group with more diversity and maybe there's a curtain and you can't see who's playing. So the person playing is behind the curtain and they mostly choose women for their musical group. So it seems that the people who are doing the evaluation have a natural bias against women because many women, they were not able to, to know who it was behind the curtain, so they were masked. Uh, their gender was masked. Now with sign language, we can't mask who it is that we're interpreting. We see their face when we're evaluating them and testing them. So we do know uh, that raters, those who are evaluating interpreters, um, they're supposed to be neutral, which means that they're not against people who are from different ethnicities, such as Black or Latino, or against women versus men. They're not supposed to have those biases. So, I mean, that's one thing to think of. And then also we have to think about validity. And validity means that the test measures what it's supposed to. Uh, for example, uh, if you have a scale and the scale is weighted a certain way, is it weighted with a certain purpose? Uh, is it weighted with the correct mass? Uh, is a scale the right way to measure something? So if I say, here's my scale over here, and then I have a second scale and that scale is here. And I have two groups of people, exact same groups of people, and I measure them by the same scale, then the mass doesn't change, right? You can't remove mass, you can only add mass in order to keep it the same. So that's the theory of testing when you're talking about having it be standardized. If I am measuring their signing skills, then I have to really be measuring their sign language skills. Uh, if it's a computer assessment, 
I would prefer that a computer assessment measure only one thing, have only one scale. And the reason why I say that is because if we have so many things that we're trying to measure one time, it becomes quite complicated for the evaluators and to stick with that one scale. And the fancy word for that is unidimensional, to have something that's unidimensional. So as we evaluate interpreters um, and we have scales or ways of measuring that we come up with, the point is we need to look at the way that interpreters produce language. We need to look at the way interpreters translate from one language to another. And those are two very different skills. And you might ask, how are they different? Well, I can sign. I've been signing you know, for my entire life, for many years, and I think I'm an okay signer. Uh, I think I could pass an American Sign Language exam, skill exam, but can I translate from one language to another? No, that's not my skill set. I haven't studied it. Um, I teach theory. Um, I'm not a certified deaf interpreter. So again, and we're talking about two completely different skills. So when we assess interpreters, what are we assessing? What are we, we want to make sure that there is validity um, and that their interpreting skills are not masked by their language skills, but that we're measuring both their language skills and their ability to translate. Two separate things. So can you have so-so mm, interpreting skills and be a good translator, be able to translate a concept from one language to another? What we measure is something called construct. That's what we're measuring. So if somebody knows sign language, then they have to have their constructs, constructs to be able to really analyze that. So it begins with phonology. With American Sign Language, we have five different phonemes or features of phonology, movement, location, uh, etc. And their syntax. There is a morphological structure, the use of classifiers. sign language fluency, various terminology that one should know. And medical interpreting has different terminology than legal interpreting. So if one were to translate from one to the other, what's their translation theory that they use when they're interpreting? Do they follow the approach taught by Betty Kalonymous? Do they use the, the approach taught by Seleskovich? Uh, can they bring that into their frame? Can they expand on the topic? Can they let go of language? So one assessing interpreting has to think about that, all of those skills as one. That's where you have to start. That's the starting point. Uh, and that's where that discussion should begin. So we have two groups to consider. We have to think about interpreters in Colorado. And those who live in Colorado. I'm in North Carolina. So I might have different ways of thinking about it, different theories, um, different things where I would say, well, this and this and this would be okay. Because I, but I don't know what it's like for people living in Colorado and what that dialogue would look like. So we took the data that we collected from people and people had several options they could select. We selected uh, some people to talk with. Um, to ask 
their thoughts. And that's the best way. But the problem is, is that it takes a long time to analyze that type of data. So imagine sitting with someone for an hour. Then two people, that's two hours. A hundred people, that's 100 hours. And then analyzing the data from all those 100 conversations. So 100 hours worth of conversation, Let's say it takes five to 10 hours to do the analysis on them. Um, typically longer, I'm telling you, I'm just putting that out there as a number. Typically it takes much longer. But now we're up to a thousand hours for the data analysis piece. So it's not, it, I mean, it takes time. It takes time. And we only had a few months with this project. And then the budget for that 1,000 hours would be astronomical. Um, 1,000 hours, at, let's say, I don't know, our costs, uh, I can't even imagine uh, having to pay interpreters for 1,000 hours worth of work. So, so obviously, um, that's not the best approach either with the limited time that we had. So what we did was develop a survey. And that survey uh, was something that we came up with. And then we tried to get some kind of idea of, of thoughts that people had out there. Um, what certifications people had, what experience they had with certification, And the second thing that we wanted to focus on was thinking, okay, let's have a definition of what we mean by interpreting assessments. Um, let's talk about reliability and validity with the various issues. How do we know that interpreter is a good interpreter? We could talk directly with the raters, right? And then we could also look at their data look at their analysis and analyze their data to see if there are any uh, particular issues that come up again and again. And what I can tell you is that how raters evaluate is different depending on the people who are in that group. Uh, sometimes maybe I can notice if there's a black interpreter um, that tends to have a lower score than white interpreters, is that because of inappropriate bias? Or perhaps I could recognize that out of these three raters, uh, the scores were quite different from three for this one person. I mean, there's a lot of information that you can piece out from that data. So when you think about it from uh, a data mining point of view, who is doing the rating? What's their experience rating other people? And then also think about the results of the data. Now we understand that it's supposed to be confidential. Um, and you know we look at data all the time. Uh, data is something that's analyzed all the time and it's uh, anonymous, it doesn't have the person's name, um, it's without their name, de-identified, so we just have person A. And then we looked at what we found from that data. And someone has a question? And we're going to switch interpreters. Okay. From the survey that we did in Colorado, we had 94 official responses. Now, we actually had more than that, but we had to consider two things. We had to be, you know, in that assessment of the data. 
they had to be resident of Colorado. And some people wouldn't admit the residency. So we had to delete them from our analysis. And some people admitted that they didn't live in Colorado, which meant they also had to be deleted, which left us with 94 official participants. I then asked, how long have you been a Colorado resident? And I assumed that people who lived in Colorado for a great length of time might have a little better idea of what Colorado's needs are, uh, that those needs you know, are tied to preferences within the community. And about 85% of individuals said that they had lived more than 12 years in Colorado, which is a pretty good number of respondents. My next slide, you'll see that I asked, what was the relationship with the deaf community? 41% were deaf or hard of hearing. And 40% were hearing, which leaves you know, a, a deaf blind individual, a deaf person who was a deaf and disabled consumer, one each. And, you know, honestly, you know, for me personally, I would want to see more deaf blind people's responses. Training for deaf blind interpreting is a huge issue within our profession at this time. And that left 15% who had members within the community that were a family member, or they might've been a deaf parent or a, they were a child of a deaf parent, et cetera. So I asked people, are you an interpreter? A communication facilitator? What does that mean? Does that mean that you work maybe in a school and you maybe provide gesture communication for a student who has yet to develop language? I mean, any gamut, you know, within that term is possible. About 26% said yes, they are interpreters. And about 12% said they were communication facilitators. 13% said they do something else, they responded as other, and you know, about half were not interpreters at all. So what does it mean you know, when they said they were other, they responded as other? Some of them worked in early intervention, some said that, they were interpreters, which is kind of an odd response. Sometimes, you know, you can't always understand in surveys exactly, you know, what is meant. You know, does it feel like, you know, it's our fault because we weren't clear? Because sometimes it's impossible to actually be clearer in our questions. But we're expecting to be clear in our assessment. So then we asked, what certification do you hold? If you're an interpreter, what certifications do you hold? And there is a huge number of certifications possible out there, about 50 possible certifications. And Cliff and Tricia will remember, you know, that I sent them a spreadsheet that had like 10 or 15 pages of all of the various certifications and all the possibilities. I mean, that was crazy. And so we just narrowed it down. Most people identified the following certifications. EIPA 3.5, that was at 15 some percent. 
14% said they were educational K-12 certified interpreters. Then 12% said that they weren't certified at all. Ten percent said they had the cer certificate of interpretation, the CI, and that and, and that's a smaller number. You know, so here in this spreadsheet, if you're interested, I can uh, let you see all of them. We can distribute this information. I am right about that. Um, um, right, Katie? Katie? Maybe she's not paying attention. Okay. At any rate. Then there were all these other certifications that were identified as well. And again, it seems that people were uncertain because some people gave us their EIPA scores. Others said they were interpreters and, and that they had all sorts of certifications. Many people said that I had only taken the written test and that was the only Place they were at that at this time. We also have some open-ended questions. You know, if you're not an interpreter, what are you? And again, you know, we asked in Colorado, what should Colorado do in terms of certification? What should be Colorado's approach? Eighty-two percent. 82% of those who responded do want a, more certification options. They want more options in comparison to 10% who wanted to keep it exactly the same with no changes whatsoever. Which means Colorado wants to increase the number of certifications offered. And, and that's good. We also asked, how have you been impacted by House Bill 19-1069? If you're an interpreter or a consumer, um, how has that impacted you? And some people said that, you know, they were a communication facilitator. They want to be certified, but they can't be. You know, uh, some are uncertified and left out. Some people said that, you know, they're paying far less. That's the impact. And a, a great number of people said that it was extremely hard to find good qualified interpreters. So we asked, you know, well, if you can't get certified, but you want certification, some people said, well, you know, I don't have a bachelor's degree. So, you know, and I want to be certified. I want a certification that allows you to be certified with less education, with perhaps a two-year AA degree. We also asked, do they already possess a certification that this law doesn't address? And, and people responded that they had the BEI. Or they, that they said that they, had, um, they were authorized as an educational interpreter. But again, you know, that's disconcerting to people because they can't meet the standard of the law. Overall, with all of this information in terms of what the impact has been, you know, as the pool has shrunk in terms of the number of qualified interpreters and the cost for interpreting services is expensive, does that mean then, you know, that you know, we have to address cost. I mean, there are interpreters who want to be interpreters, but they aren't certified, they're not licensed. And many said that 
well, you know, it doesn't impact me at all. I'm not certified. No, that's just the way it is. Overall, no, this is fine. No, if you assess and you know what you want, I mean, there are many possibilities. Many people identify the BEI. Some people mention Utah, and some people mention the EIPA, to be acknowledged. At the end, I said, well, we have our ID. How do you feel about that? 60% said yes, they wanted to retain the RID certification, maintain involvement and membership in RID. 7% said no, a much smaller figure. 31% were ambivalent. They, it seems that most people still want to have RID certification, but there are those who are ambivalent about it. So we surveyed people and took a pulse and we have a, a pretty good idea about what Colorado wants. And there are some challenges, of course. Our second survey was sent to assessing companies. And there are a wide number of companies who provide interpreting assessments. CDI, DPI, ASLPI, CI, RID. There's a number of certifications out there. Utah has a certification assessment. Yes, KQAS, Katie Wright, KQAS. There's a number of assessments out there. So, what does that tell us? The only response that we got when we assessed these different companies was from the BEI and from Utah. Those are the only responses. So when we developed our assessment, our questionnaire, we had very superficial information. Some of that information is easily available online. So then research it myself online. Well, we were looking in part about an assessment company who wants to work for Colorado to provide their services here in Colorado as their business. And that they would want Colorado to accept them because were that to happen, they would gain a lot of money, a lot of income from the individuals taking their assessment. You know, the psychology is that, you know, if you, send in the test but then you also have to do that in their their whole system right you have to become a part of their whole system and uh, coronavirus has had some effect as well in terms of this survey so we asked kind of superficially you know what kind of assessment they offer you know is it a performance or is it written is it on the computer or not you know what is the cost how many hours does it take i mean these are very superficial kinds of questions Only two companies responded. So I guess then we have to ask the hard question. I really want their radar information. Not who, not who, but what do raters look like within their system, their age, uh, their sex. Are they transgender? Are they, what is their practicing background? Do they have linguistics background? Um, are they deaf, are they hearing? I mean, there's all of that information that we're seeking as well. Are we, our goal is really we wanna have a very diverse rater pool assessing, but no one would respond to this question. 
Now, Utah was willing to explain a bit, but they didn't provide any data, any numbers to follow up. Utah did explain that they do have a diverse pool, that the individuals are those who are from, you know, representing the queer community. Some of them, you know, come from various ethnicities. There's diversity. So then I wanted to know you know de-identified de de de-identified data in their assessment, their results. For the first agency, you know, is it women, men, you know, um, or the hearing or deaf, you know, do they have any identification? You know, you know, how wide and broad, you know, is the spectrum, you know, in their evaluation? That's something that we want to do in order to provide fairness and, and equity across the board. No one re responded to this question. So we have to deal with the data that we do have and it's not much. So Katie and I talked about this because, you know, no one sent us something where, you know, we could really take a close look at and consider what I have actually is a commitment from two agencies that are committed to work with us. And that's through the BEI and from Utah. Now, the BEI is a better company. As you say, many interpreters are familiar with the BEI. And I personally, you know, outside, as an outsider from Colorado, you know, I, you know, suggest the BEI to some of my students myself because our ID was not always available out there. And so I would suggest the BEI because I even know personally about the BEI. I did take a look at their documents and I have a pretty good understanding of their approach. But then we take a look at Utah, our second responder. We do have some examples from Utah, um, some here to, with us tonight, some representatives who are willing to answer questions about the Utah assessment, answer questions that I can't answer personally. Utah is a new assessment. Their assessment is new. They took and and got rid of an older assessment and, and developed a new one. Now, because it's new means they don't have a lot of historical data and you know any information of that nature to provide. However, even though they couldn't give me data to uh, analyze, they did explain how they train their raters. And you know what, I think that they do it right. You know, to a point where I think that that will provide them a good foundation for their assessment. The BEI, BEI is a challenge. It is out of Texas. So how can that test be provided? You know, where's the testing center? Who's gonna be the evaluator? Utah is closer. It is closest, you know, and so, you know, and I'm in North Carolina, so, you know, I don't know, but, you know, and, and, and that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I lived in Boulder for six years, you know, it, you know, we've got a small state. You know, I would drive for an hour and I would get to two different states. You know, the West, you know, that's in North Carolina, West is a big open spaces, you know, 
you know, I would drive six hours, you know, in Texas and I'd still be in Texas. Well, there are pros and cons to both. And Katie and I talked about this and, you know, for quite some time. Our recommendation is that on all of the information that we've gathered thus far, and we've worked on this for, I would say, you know, about, we've talked about this for about an hour. But we are comfortable suggesting the BEI and Utah as potential assessments for Colorado. Now, I recommend that Colorado doesn't necessarily abide by this. Just because we recommend it doesn't put it in stone. We're only providing a recommendation based on quite a bit of missing data. And it seems that Colorado really wants and is okay with both Utah and the BEI. But setting that aside, there are many in Colorado who are disgruntled by the certification that's required in Colorado. A good number of individuals want the educational certification to become part of the statute, to be allowed. And the problem is, is that the EIPA didn't send me anything. I got absolutely no information from it. There was no showing of any commitment. And there was no data for me. So I cannot suggest any educational certification because I received absolutely nothing regarding that assessment. And again, you know, my suggestions, recommendations are not set in stone for you. If anyone in the audience has an educational certification and you want uh, this, you know, this is a process that's going to go on for quite some time. Katie, Dr. Q and I, you know, we both are in agreement that, you know, all we can do is make a recommendation. You know, a, something that we can be confident in based on the sum of our work and this process with decision-making that we've gone through and that we realized that what we did thus far, and th that's the reason why we couldn't say, this is the good exam. It's really beyond our capability. Secondly, assessment companies really do need to collaborate with us a great deal more than they have been willing to do so. And I just think today that, you know, speaking from my 10 years of experience in developing all sorts of assessments, right now we still are uncertain how to assess American Sign Language well and how to separate out American Sign Language skills and interpreting skills. We have 30 years of history And that history isn't perfect. Many of us are still working on this very great question. So Dr. Q, Katie, is there anything that you would like to add? We can't hear you. I think, John, you were spot on in your analysis of the data that we've received so far. Dr. Henner uh, was a perfect description uh, of all the data that we received and your background knowledge and experience that you shared with me was very helpful for the project. So I thank you for that. Uh, your presentation explained the issues in depth and now our audience has several questions. Um, it's a webinar format, it's a little bit odd. So I can't turn on your cameras myself, my, your videos. So if you would like to ask a question, you have two options. You can type your question into the chat box, which some people are doing. 
Um, but a webinar also has something called a Q&A box. And I'll recognize both of those. But there is a third option. If you would rather sign your own question, let me know and I'll enable you as a panelist, which means that you can then turn your video on to ask your question. So please be patient with me through this process. All right. Uh, Cliff, Trish, did you want to add anything before we move to the questions? Sounds great. Uh, so, okay, before we actually proceed in uh, answering questions from all of you, I think most of um, those answers will come from John and Katie, but I want to know what the next step is for us. I think it's important for you all to be aware that we are going to be going through a process of rulemaking with the State Board of Colorado's Department of Human Services. They have a rulemaking process that identifies, you know, certification and whether a certificate is valid or continues to be reliable. And that is going to be tied to the consumer protection law that already recognizes RID certification. So the rules are already there in place for that certification and they will be kept separate. They're not going to be combined. The rulemaking that we will be doing will be tied to this current law and that's very unique how this law was written. We are going to have an opportunity to have a lengthy discussion at this point, but I think that it's going to take about six to nine months for this rulemaking process. We have two opportunities to discuss with the State Board. We have an open public hearing and that's where individuals can come and submit questions, challenges, any considerations or ideas as well as suggestions at that hearing for any modifications. The second hearing will be our last opportunity that will then ultimately prove our rules. So we will continue to give this information out to you throughout our process of developing the rules. We most certainly will keep you apprised. And the people who are participating in this town hall, you know, we will keep your contact information so that we can provide this information to you all and it'll be for that purpose. So Katie, um, where are we at with questions? Okay, give me just a moment to look at the chat. Okay, the first question is from Susan Brown. And our question is, the survey, was that sent to interpreters only? Or was that also sent to the deaf community? And I was about to type an answer that I thought I'd better hold. Um, I, the survey was sent to everyone. Dan Lasher says, um, I don't see the question, I only see the response. All right, so hold on one moment. Katherine Johnson says she's an interpreter in Colorado and she never received that survey. Hmm. So the surveys were mostly sent out by the commission, correct? And I think they were sent out what? As a people. Um, how many, four or five times, I'm sorry, how many times actually did we send that survey out? This is clip. We sent it out three times and it was through an e-blast. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I would encourage you to sign up for the commission's email because uh, it seems that some interpreters also saw that it was shared on uh, Colorado Registry of Interpreters for the Deaf for their website as well. And AJ Moody is asking, uh, what did John say about Utah? Um, I think that was the part of the discussion where were you talking about demographics, maybe? Um, AJ, you wanna clarify your question? Okay, um, he hasn't responded, so we'll come back to that later. All right, uh, Carmela Royval also says, it's hard to see the questions that people have typed. 
Um, it's odd. I guess your question's a little bit separate from the chat. Uh, and so we'll move it over to Q&A soon. Um, Stacy Nichols says, I want to have some concrete data to read. So your registration for this town hall includes a summary PowerPoint. You can also contact me for a copy of the full report. Uh, Susan Brown's response. Uh, to the EIP part said, I will work with all of you to get data from the EIPA. And then Brene Klopfuch says, I am wondering what is the biggest change in regards to assessment for Utah? Um, I think, um Trenton, I think uh, Trenton should answer that, what I'm saying. I think if we can have the panelists from Utah join us and respond to that would be best. That would be great, thank you, Katie. Uh, this is Trish, perhaps I can take my camera off and then we can see those panelists better. Katie's saying I think, you'll, I think you'll be fine, I'm just waiting for Trenton to come on board, come on camera. Hello, everybody. Sorry, you know, I didn't realize that you were identifying me specifically. Yes, this is Trenton Marsh. Yes. Um, and it would help if you can respond to questions about the Utah assessment. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Certainly. First of all, I want to tell you, oh my gosh, your survey was tough. You know, I was just branded by the time I tried to figure out how to answer it and try to figure out, you know, what you know what something meant even in your survey so i will tell you that a bit it was a bit of a challenge so i hope i did the best job possible you know i sweated over this you know but i did first want to say hi to everyone because i'm a former coloradan and i am certainly now a utah man for sure but we are sister states most certainly so thank you for inviting me to your town hall good to see you all at any rate uh i didn't see the question specifically what was the question uh, this is Kate. Actually, there were two. The Utah assessment, um, what's the biggest change? Sure. That's a great question. Just to let you know, you call it an assessment, a certification, test, or whatever. We call it a certification test and have all along. You know, that's our terminology here. And it, that's been since the mid-90s. Uh, maybe 95, 96, 97. It was before my time, before I moved to Utah. So uh, we've been in this, I guess, game for quite a long time. But, you know, it's always been homegrown. We've always done our own work in our own community, meeting together, and that's how it started from the beginning. We used to do live interviews, and that's going way back to a pretty old approach, and we've evolved over time. But our most recent version, the most recent version, was in place and has been in place for a good 10 years. Uh, so we feel like it's already becoming antiquated. So that has led to some significant changes and development of a brand new assessment or new test. And you asked me for data on that new test, and we haven't collected enough data to be able to provide that. We have a lot of data from our old assessment, but they're two totally different tests. and so. Well, I didn't share any of that data with you because it was, well, it's certainly too soon for our new test, and that was the reason. Nevertheless, I would like to say that, you know, there have been significant changes in several ways. First of all, interpreting is not just one way. It isn't. So it doesn't mean, you know, do interpreters just interpret one direction throughout? Well, maybe it seems to be that case right now, you know, for Linda and Jolinda because they're interpreting all the way. But most of the time, interpreting is quite interactive. Most of the work is interactive. I mean, in general practice. And so we had to shift from testing with one way interaction, you know, and, and whether it would be expressively or receptively with signing or voicing and putting more heavy emphasis on it interaction and should it be more with signing and then to see that shift in terms of a dialogue between a hearing and a deaf person or you know for them to voice for a hearing for a deaf presenter all the way 
through a presentation, so to speak, but then adding interaction. Uh, so it created more elements that were closer to what daily work and daily practice of an interpreter looks like. So that was probably our greatest shift from our old test to our new test. And I think that that's quite major. That's a major shift. We have three different assessments. And the survey was challenging for me to respond to because we have three separate tests. Plus we have two different knowledge tests. And so I kind of felt like, you know, I only had one small space to put all this information in, so that made it a little more difficult, but I gave you what I could. At any rate, we, we recognize that uh, we have two levels. Uh, so there are hearing assessments. We have the novice and the professional level, those two different tests and for different reasons. Uh, at any rate, uh, both of those tests also add in a team with a deaf interpreter that is required now that they are working with the deaf team. So hearing interpreters need to be able to show how they work with a deaf team. And I've never seen that in an assessment. The deaf assessment always has had a part where they had to work with a hearing interpreter, receiving information from a hearing interpreter. But you know, deaf interpreters have always had to show that skill, but we've not had that required of hearing interpreters. So we decided to add that in this assessment to encourage them to start practicing that work and using that approach in their work as a hearing interpreter. And to me, that is a huge paradigm shift, including that part to our test for hearing interpreters. We also just developed our very own state deaf, ass deaf assessment for certified deaf interpreters. And it was hard to know what else to call us other than the certified deaf interpreters, but we tried really hard to come up with a better terminology and we finally just have stuck with it but it's Utah State's Certified Deaf Interpreter Assessment. And uh, that is in place and we created it ourselves and we face the same challenges that you have in Colorado and just the same challenges that RID has had. You know, and people have had to wait and we've waited to develop our own because in our own state, we require that anyone who works as an interpreter, they do need to be certified and there is just nothing else. They have to be certified to work in Utah. So now we're creating this opportunity for deaf interpreters, and so we have three tests in total, uh, and then two knowledge tests, um, one for hearing participants and one for deaf participants, because they each have different knowledge bases coming to the work. And um, the knowledge tests that we've used for hearing people, we had a test and we made modifications before we started developing our new test. So um, we carried some questions in from our old test, and then, you know, we have three performance tests and we have also a, a knowledge test for the deaf interpreters which is new for them so we brought in a knowledge test for the deaf interpreters as well so at any rate that hopefully provides you a better answer now I think you had a second question what was the other question for me uh, this is Katie this is from Deandra Stacy and she is asking I am wondering how the Utah assessment or certificate is different from the BEI you know, I'm not familiar with the BEI. I'm not that knowledgeable about it. Um, here in Utah, we do recognize that you're thinking about a variety of certifications, you know, what's out there, what you might recognize. But we um, do have um, a couple of options that we do recognize in Utah. The BEI has yet to be recognized. It has not shown up in our state. No one has brought it or requested to have it considered as a certification in Utah. So, you know, we've considered other options that seem to meet our community's needs thus far. So I can't really answer that question as to how we compare to BEI. Uh, I don't really know how to answer that. What I would say, in, uh, if I might just add, that I did talk to uh, someone in Idaho because their commission, um, I know you're CCDHH in Colorado, at Idaho is what is their call? I think it's Idaho Council for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. Okay, all right, thank you, Cliff, thank you. So I talked to their director, uh, Stephen Snow, and he brought up a good point a couple of years ago. And you know, I remember and have kept that in mind, and I guess I'm gonna pass this on to you as well, because what he mentioned was that in Idaho, their legislature has been a bit uncertain, not, not afraid of, but they're taking a very careful stance in not having their state law depend on a separate private entity. For testing, you know, that change, you know, changes that happen there 
put a vector law. And now that's happening for you because RAD had a moratorium on their test and you had no other options in Colorado and that's in statute. And so you, because you've been tied to a private entity and Idaho said, you know what, they're, they're just not willing to do that. They're not going to mention one entity as the certifying body in their statute. And so they wanted that flexibility. And so they took our idea out as well. So they, you know, can have other options available to them. So I just wanted to let you know that that's what's happened for them. And I just wanted to pass that on because, you know, I'm not here to speak for Idaho and I have no judgment on their decision, but I did want to pass that on as a concern that they brought to me. Uh, John, you had a thought? Yes, this is John. Uh, we did put in our recommendation to Colorado. Um, when did they not develop their own assessment? Did not, okay. And we made that recommendation because it takes several years to pull it together. You know what, that is very true. Trenton saying that's very true. Several more years to collect enough data to show that the test is valid. And if it's not valid, then you have to start all over again with that's development, and that's going to take you several more years down the road. It is a challenge. Um, so you're looking at a good five to ten years, you know, and uh, everyone's fighting. Well. So another point about developing your own assessment is that it's going to be very expensive if you're truly doing it right. So. You have to, you know, get investments from the state. Uh, so that would mean that Colorado have, would have to make a decision for themselves. Do they want to invest in developing their own assessment? Um, that is a huge investment and one that is long time-wise as well. Or do they want to follow the path that other states have taken where they know that they have something good that is already documented that, that they can then use, such as what Utah described. So in general, I do not recommend uh, that an association or a state set up their own assessment unless you're willing to make that commitment, long-term commitment. He said very true, I'm saying very true. Uh, this is Trish here, and I am just wondering, in Utah, do you recognize other certifications as well? You mentioned that, what are they? Yes, uh, thank you. Yes, we do recognize several. So um, back in the day, we recognized scan agent certification. Well, that was then. You know, if you know if it were to come back, I mean, I don't know. I mean, now we were we would be shocked to see NAD come back up with a, a certification. But there are a number of RID certification and we certifications, and we've recognized all of theirs, and we see them as a national standard. Well, certainly still. And then we also have recognized the EIPA, but we do have certain expectations in terms of the EIPA 3.5 with a time limit where they have to increase to a 4.0 in order to sustain that certification. If they don't move to a 4.0 or above within four years, then we stop recognizing them as a certified interpreter. It's not that we remove their certification, we just will no longer accept them as a certified interpreter if they're at, uh, below a 4.0 if it's longer than four years. So we did. Uh, agree to recognize that certification. Then we have our own certification assessments, which obviously we recognize our own. Uh, let me think. I, 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 like I said, we don't recognize the BEI because nobody's recognized or brought the BEI to us. But you know, I'm, I'm curious about their trilingual uh, certification, and we'd like to see something done. We haven't seen anything formal yet, but we have a certification board, ICB, Interpreter Certification Board, that is going to have to bring to the conversation and do some research regarding that because if we feel that it's worthy of our support then we will then bring that up to our state to get that approved we have yet to do that but um, we do know that the BEI is doing something in that regard but nothing has been brought to us and we haven't had any conversation with them around that but that's that's all we've recognized thus far now John was talking about validity now should assessments measure just one thing well, I imagine that you could consider that, you know, but with certification and educational interpreters, the EIPA really applies to the educational arena. It's for that setting. Community types of interpreting certifications apply to general community types of assessment or settings. And legal certification, that really is a specialty that should be considered separately as well. So what are you testing? Vocabulary, you know, is it a terminology issue? Uh, well, you know, there's, you know, language that comes into play 
but I just thought that's something else that's interesting for you to take into consideration and to compare. Um, Katie, were there other people who wanted, or Trish, did you have a comment? Um, you know, and I can step uh, aside, um, Katie. This is Katie, can you stand by Trenton in case I need you? Um, are there other states that recognize Utah certification is the question. Yes, actually, uh, we have a long history with Idaho. And so Idaho, um, we are one of their recognized assessors and uh, their interpreters who come to, to Utah. Um, and I think there are also a few from Nevada that have also come to uh, Utah to take our assessment. Um, John mentioned um, talking about you know, various parts of the country and that an uh, interpreter that's recognized as a good interpreter somewhere in the country might not be recognized as a good interpreter elsewhere. I actually think that our, our test is regional and I do think that our assessment does seem to be a good fit for the West, for out West. But I do want to let you know, we're not trying to sell our assessment or test to anyone, you know? I mean, we offer our test and if somebody wants to come and take the Utah test and go back home, that's really then up to those various states to determine whether they want to recognize our test or not. But we have no interest in expanding. I mean, we're here really just to serve, to offer our test. This is Katie, great. Let's see. Okay, um, I don't see any more questions about Utah. Thank you so much for popping on. If we have something, I'll get you to Absolutely. come. Absolutely, I think I'll, I'll go off screen then now. Thanks. Okay, and then now I'm gonna move from chat to Q&A. And Noemi is asking 94 responses. Oh, I think John answered that already. Okay. Um, this is a person who didn't identify their name. They're anonymous. Um, while I do agree that screening of sign language versus interpreting is important, I don't see the connection about, see anything about interpreting ethics. And I think that ethics is a very big issue. So I'm wondering, will interpreting ethics be included in this discussion of the assessment? John is saying no. Uh, no, um, we can't assess, we can't measure ethics. So uh, for ethics, that really would be something that the commission would need to discuss further. Okay, perfect. Right. Uh, the next question again is anonymous, and they ask, uh, "When this? When will this become effective and part of the law?" This is Cliff. As I mentioned earlier, that we will have to go through the rulemaking process that will require six to nine months uh, before we uh, have people receive the pre-registration packet. We'll be submitting that to the board. Um, and then that will go, you know, August 1st to the state board. And sometime after that, six to nine months after that, it will become official before it's put into uh, state law. And uh, that isn't part of the law itself, but will be connected to the current law that we have in place. Okay. And the next question is from Nori Mariaki. And Nori says, for K-12 interpreters, how do we make sure that CDE... I'm what sorry, did you, did you say... CDE, Commission on Education, okay. How do we ensure that CDE um, is accountable or some sort of accountable agency um, who is planning to receive those evaluations for those who are K through 12 after they're certified with the EIPA? What if their scores seem low for Colorado and they want to get higher scores? Then what can be done to help evaluate all of the K through 12 interpreters to get their skills up, not just CEUs? So um, I don't know if you can all see the Q&A, but that's where I'm taking that question from.
Cliff, John, Trish, someone want to answer that about? Um, Cliff, are you saying you want me to answer? I certainly can. Um, actually, currently, we've been focusing on community interpreting. And that uses the consumer protection law to protect members of our community, not educational interpreting. And so, and educational interpreting is important. And so that conversation needs to take place at another place in another time. So I think, hang on to that. Uh, the Colorado Department of Education has not been part of this assessment that was done. We didn't ask any questions about educational interpreting um, in this survey either. This is Cliff, I agree. This is Katie. The next question comes from Trianne River in the Q&A. And the question is, is there data with BIPOC interpreters in Colorado or BIPOC deaf? in Colorado? By um, in terms of what? Um, I'd like to know specifically what you're looking for. I don't know. They just want to know data about BIPOC death. Unfortunately, I can't answer um, at this time. Uh, maybe Trianne will add to their question and expand on what they mean. OK, Odie Allen. Ask the question, is RID certification active? This is Cliff. Um, I don't know if anyone else answers, wants to answer this. I'll simply say that RID exists and uh, it is still there, um, certainly. Yes. Yes, and Cliff, it seems that some of the tests are in moratorium and they're in the process of shifting them. I don't know if they're all coming back or not, but they're in the process of, uh, I believe, the CDI and the performance exam. That's right. This is a but the knowledge exam is available. Um, right. Also, uh, there is an interim certification is available as well, but it's pretty limited, I think. There are only three statewide who have that. Trish, did you want to add something? Yes, you're right, um, Katie. Uh, it's not easy. It's very challenging to get that temporary endorsement. Um, many people uh, don't even recognize it, so they dropped it. It was tough to get that PBIC. And the Castley, they really provide the assessments now. It isn't RID. It's under Castley which uh, was impacted by COVID-19. And so everything has been put on hold all over the country because of that. People have been looking for where they might go to take the test and that's been one of the problems. Um, so there's no testing place in Colorado currently. Uh, Cassidy has been looking for a site in Colorado. Uh, this is Cliff. So Cassidy, is, stands for the Center for Assessment of Sign Language Interpreters. That's right. And it's uh, completely separate from RID. I mean, they are linked in some ways, but it is a separate organization. Okay, the next question Katie's saying is from Rachel Rose. And her question is, I'm wondering if the panelists um, I guess the four of you, or three of you, you know, do you see a value in having Colorado connect uh, with another specialties that the BEI offers, such as the medical, legal, or the trilingual? Um, do we see any of those being recognized in Colorado? This is John. I recommended that there be a specific assessment company um, I didn't recommend specific specialties or specific kinds of assessments, just the assessment company itself. So that would mean it would be up to the board as to which of those specialty certifications they would like to offer um, based on the needs of Coloradans. This is Trish. I am interested in two different type of specialist certifications from BEI, the court interpreting specialist and also 
the intermediary. That is their term for the deaf interpreter. They're calling the deaf interpreter an intermediary. The BEI offers both of those types of specialty certificates. And so I'm interested in taking a closer look as to what those tests look like and what their level of skill is in those tests um, on a personal level, because I know that we have in Colorado a requirement for legal training, requirement for mentoring and everything to become qualified as a legal interpreter in Colorado. So I'm wondering what BEIs uh, looks like. Um, and then, you know, we use the RID and the CBI, and there are many of the RIDs tests that have been on hold and have been on, on hold for a very long time. So it's not fair to deaf interpreters, you know, because where can they get certified? You know, what's available? In, you know, in Colorado, we only are, recognize RID, which is very frustrating for our deaf interpreters when they can't get certified. And Cassidy has announced that they are going to have a performance test. They said it would be in January, and then they postponed it to less this past March. Now it's being postponed once again, and uh, you know, hopefully till next month. But will that actually come out then, or will they have to delay that CDI testing one more time? We don't know. Uh, this is Katie. Um, I lived in Texas for a very short period of time, and I had an opportunity to assess the BEI, and the different levels are quite unique. It's very easy for a deaf consumer uh, and an interpreter uh, to identify their qualifications um, and to know which environment is the best fit for them. Um, so for me, I was very impressed with that. That is very clear. Um, and, you know, if you're a good fit for this person or that environment. So I saw that more in Texas. Um, it was quite different from anywhere else that I've lived. All right, thank you, Cliff. This is Cliff. After next Saturday's town hall meeting, we are going to get started working on the role making process, developing these roles, and that'll be a couple of months uh, where we will identify the certifications that we will recognize within the state of Colorado. And at that point, we will have further conversation with you. Uh, tonight, uh, we aren't able to identify a specific certification. Uh, we are taking all of this into consideration. All right, and then the next questions are pretty similar, so I'm gonna put them out together at the same time. Um, Bucky Justin Buckhold is asking a question. His question is, uh, can John expand more on his recommendations for Colorado uh, as to the BEI? Are you talking about the different levels of BEI? Which levels specifically did you recommend? And you answered that already. Um, and somebody else asked a question from an anonymous participant. Will you accept all levels? And I think that we've already addressed both of those. Um, that we didn't make a specific recommendation for a level. We just recommended the company itself. And then the commission can um, analyze those levels at a later point in time. Cliff is saying that is correct. And Odie Allen asked, what is PDCI? What is that? Uh, and also asked which email address to use to send her comments. Uh, yes, the PDIC, that is Provisional Deaf Interpreters Credential. And I believe that's what that acronym stands for. I believe I remembered that correctly. That is a PDIC. And that was an intermediary step. It was a temporary offering because no testing was in place. And when people had passed the knowledge test and they were ready to take a performance test, uh, a performance test wasn't available. And because they'd waited so long, they offered a PDIC and it was a temporary offering uh, that showed that the person was on their way to becoming certified. And that's how they could verify that through a PDIC. But as was already mentioned, um, you know, it's, it's really challenging to find a tester and, and ultimately all of that stopped. But I think it was a second question. The uh, second question was, what was the preferred email address to contact the commission? You can email Katie or you can email me, Frisch, um, in uh, either address that you would prefer. 
Um, Katie, do you want to put our emails in the chat box for people? Um, you can put my email in there. Oh, it is there? Okay, great. Okay, let's see. Uh, Bucky said, I am wondering, um, will the commission, are they open to establishing a committee for anyone who wants to join? Would they welcome us? I mean, it would be great to have the community be a part of this process and the work that you're doing. Uh, this is the, the short answer to that is yes. We will be including community members um, as we go through our discussion and determining the rules. And we'll announce that through our newsletter or in an e-blast. So you'll be hearing more. So sign up, this is Katie, sign up so you don't miss it. All right, and Nori has a question. What type of risk are you anticipating before making a decision as to which certification and should we have better data regarding the exam? Can you elaborate more? And I'm not sure if I understand Nori's question. One moment. So, uh, this is Cliff. If I could go back um, to that acronym for Kathleen, when I told you what Kathleen stood for, I didn't think I'd gotten it right. And actually, the accurate is the center the the accurate is the center for assessment of language interpreters that's what c-a-s-l-i stands for i wanted to make sure that i had been perfectly clear with all of you all right and this is katie if i remember right our id is the one who actually uh established counseling is that correct that is correct okay so it was established by RID. And it separated from RID um, to become a testing center apart from RID. Okay, and Nori, did you want to sign your own question? Well, when you ask about data, John saying. Um, I'm going to give Nori an opportunity to respond. Um, in the meantime, Stacy Nichols has a question. Uh, do some of the tests require ASLPI too? This is John. No assessment company um, has uh, given me that information. Um, we did uh, submit our questionnaire to the ASLPI and I got no response. So just to let you know that North Carolina in Greensboro at the university, we do use the ASLPI assessment in assessing interpreter skills for our graduates. And that is in terms of their ASL performance. So they're signing. And the reason is because it's, it's the only one. Okay, and Gabriella has a question. Uh, I am wondering if the BEI exam is recognized in as, as a certification in Colorado, and are we planning to host that in our state instead of having interpreters travel to Texas? Also, will the CDE recognize the BEI for educational interpreters working in that setting in the way that they recognize the e -A -E -I -P -A currently? So, uh Yes, this is Trish. The BEI does allow some states to get a license, so to speak, which means then that that particular state can offer the BEI in their state. An example of that is Michigan. Michigan is allowed to do so, as is Illinois. Missouri also is a BEI testing center. It's possible that Colorado could contract with Texas uh, to rent the test, so to speak, to bring it here so that we could provide that assessment, that test here within our state. That is possible, but uh, that costs money and we'd have to look for the funds uh, for that. Uh, plus we need to provide training 
uh, in order to have raters, we have to hire trainers and raters, and it's a bit of a complicated process. So there is that. The second piece of that, I'm sorry, Cliff. And I think it would be a separate time and place for that because the state legislature has not given us the funds uh, to approach it in that way. Right now, we are only to identify certification that is valid and reliable. That's our charge. Right. Trenton uh, has something to add regarding Utah's CDI. So I'm going to see if he's still available. He could come on screen. Trenton, go ahead. Thank you. So John mentioned the fact that uh, how much time it takes to make sure a new test is valid uh, and to have enough data. So when you're thinking about creating an exam and getting all that together, we went through a pilot process where we piloted the test. We made some changes based on the feedback that we received and we thought, okay, here it is. But even then, you still have to get the test out there. You have to use it. People have to take it. With RID and Castly, anything new that they develop is going to go through that same process of test development in order to improve it. So that's one thing. Our deaf test is new, uh, but it's still very, very exciting, very exciting because it's something that we definitely needed. There was a need, so we kept pushing for that. So now is the perfect time. You see deaf interpreters all over the nation on media. Um, and I think that we're gonna ride that wave. You know, we're gonna just do it. Um, so I'm very excited about where we are. Uh, I would also like to say that because our state, um, the way our state is, has established this, um, we're not stuck with it. You know, we're, we're flexible. We're able to move things around, but it's a way to start, you know, a way to get things going, a way to open up. So if, people pass it, then we'll think, okay, move on and take the knowledge test or take the performance test first. It's different than the way it has been in other places that I've seen. So if you're curious and you want to know more, um, go ahead and check it out. Uh, the data that we've collected so far is a very small amount, a small pool of people who've taken it. Um, I mean, our state only has 3.2 million. I think Denver, the city of Denver is equal to the population of our state. We have plenty of room for you, plenty of room to come on in and try taking your test. And I do believe that um, it's really encouraging uh, interpreters to, to grow and to we planted that seed. So it's different and it's exciting. And I think that the approach that we've taken is fresh. So I encourage you to come on out and try it. Um, put your name on the list. That's one thing that you can do. And you can take the test for yourself and see what it's like. Thank you. And Cliff, did you want to ask a question? Yeah, I guess that um, I'm wondering if you, you know, you developed the performance test before the written test. I was just curious which way you went. Yeah, I'm happy that you asked me. So really, uh, I've been involved with the interpreting field for many years uh, as a trainer and so forth. And I have to say that people really struggle. I mean, they really struggle at taking one part before the other. And they, and they struggle with that, not because, I mean, for those who have training and who go through ITP and who uh, are fluent in English, it's great. But for other people going through multiple choice, they would fail the knowledge exam and that would impact them. And they would start to feel like I can't do it. And they thought, well, I wanna be a part of the interpreting community. I have something to offer to the interpreting community, but they kept coming against this brick wall with passing the knowledge test. It's like, I've never seen that. I mean, I'm native signer. I've never seen somebody ask about this multiple choice question. So that was why we thought, well, maybe we should do the performance first. So we switched it to try to see if people really had that innate ability to interpret and to match language and to be language brokers and interpreters, and they could. So we thought, great, well then come on over and learn what you need for taking the knowledge part of it. So again, values. What are our values? What's our value system? We thought it would be stronger for us in terms of assessing someone's communication skills to do that part first, you knowing to then have them 
be a member of that community. And the interpreting community was, you know, people were thrilled that they passed the RID knowledge test. And I'm like, that's only half of the game, you know, but just the fact that it encouraged people to be motivated um, and that people then set the goal to get, go all the way and to get their certification. Um, and then we could support them along that road to certification. So with deaf interpreters, uh, they would come against this knowledge exam and go, well, you know, the hearing interpreters are lucky because they can take it in English and they pass that first, you know, so they were demotivated, so to speak. Um, you can't be an interpreter with just half of the exam. So we invited them to take the performance part first and they thought, well, this is definitely going to be worth my time then to read up and study and get ready, you know, to put it in there and get the knowledge to pass and really be a certified, fully certified interpreter. So that was some of the thought process that went behind it for us here in Utah. And uh, I think it's made a big difference. Ms. Cliff, you know, I do know that uh, within the state of Utah, you also do not license interpreters. You provide certification only. That's correct, right. Um, we do recognize it, but yes, that's correct. Uh, another, there was something else that I wanted to share. Uh, what was it? We were talking about the knowledge exam. Oh, our knowledge exam is 100% ASL based. And that might be something that's new. Mm -hmm. um, we don't depend on a person's ability to read English. It's ASL based. Uh, they respond in ASL. Um, and uh, no one has gone through it yet. So it's gonna be interesting, you know, to have this vision. Um, so we're curious too as to how it's gonna work out, but that's our approach. Um, our approach is just a knowledge check, you know, it's a knowledge check um, and our goal is not, you know, to give a reading test, but it, it's a knowledge check. So that's a way that we've approached it. Um, and again, uh, it is multiple choice for the hearing interpreters. Uh, deaf interpreters take that knowledge choice. It's 14 questions, very short answers. Uh, they give us maybe some examples, uh, maybe uh, three or four examples we ask for in that questions and then a uh, six question essay that we expect them to answer some open ended questions um, where we talk about what their perspective is on certain topics and they get a chance to expound on that. So it's a new approach and we'll see how it goes. This is Cliff. How novel. Mm -hmm. yeah. It Indeed. sounds really nice. Yeah. Thank you. No, it sounds good. You know, I think that uh, now you just have to come up with the name, the Utah Certification of Interpreters, UCDI or something like that. You need to think about that. UCDI. Yeah, so you have some kind of a label. You need to have a label. We did, we did try to come up with something. And we went around and around chasing a needle in the head stuff. We thought about, I mean, somebody had already had the CDI and we thought, well, rid has got the CDI. When I keep that part, I'm gonna keep the DI part, but what's a better word to come before DI? Like, if you wanna come up with something and let me know, I'm great. Yeah, this is gonna be, you know, if you live in Colorado, you breathe our thin air. I'm pretty that good. creativity comes to form. <laughs> Don't you know? That's all, I won't waste your time, but just wanted to let you know that we're very excited about it. We have high hopes yeah. and we'll share that. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to add a comment, if I might. This is Katie. So as Trenton was talking about that, and what John mentioned earlier as well, that you know we only had one respondent who was deaf and blind. And I think that that is certainly a, a concern as well, because that's very critical. And so do your research, not only paying attention to who shows up um, and, and speaks and, 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 and speaks out, but make sure that you give more attention to who's not responding, who's missing. We know people who answer, you know, we've got their names, you know who they are, but who haven't we heard from? Those are the people that are going to be really important. It's not because they may not care or they don't think it's important, but rather that may they not, not, may not have had access the way that we distributed our survey. And so I think that's a very important piece to keep attention to. And then another part of the certification test, I was thinking about this yesterday as well, that hearing interpreters, they have numerous options. They can take any certification test they want, whatever they want. 
But do deaf interpreters have that same access? No. And again, you need to pay attention to who you, is in the center of this. This is all about hearing interpreters. And you know, we talk about CDIs and deaf interpreters, you know, yeah, but you know, we assume the default equals hearing interpreters. That's where we go. We think of hearing interpreters. Why don't we shift our thinking and make the deaf interpreters be the center of our focus instead of hearing interpreters? And, and instead of saying CDIs, why don't we focus on CHIs? That's just another thing to think about. You know, who is the center of all of our statements? Who benefits the most? Who is affected the most? It's just, you know, I, I, I should move on. Odie wanted to ask for our email address, so I did give Trisha's and my email addresses there, there in chat. And AJ Moody also added that I like Utah's approach. I appreciate Trent's, Trenton's answer completely. And then also, uh, there was another person who remained anonymous that said, let me see. Are you choosing or most likely to choose the BEI because you already have BEI certified interpreters in Colorado um, and not going to be willing to incorporate the Utah assessment? Oh yeah, I think, it, go ahead, John. Uh, this is John. We recommended uh, because the assessments met several criteria. First of all, did they respond to us? Did they tell us something in that response? And BEI had, there were several people who wanted the BEI in their responses. Um, so that tells us something. And the other issue was the EIPA. Several people said that they wanted that, but EIPA did not respond to us. So I can't, I could not recommend it based on that. This is Katie. Um, we didn't pick the BEI solely because there are BEI certified interpreters in Colorado. We uh, selected it as one of our recommendations because of what John just said. All right, well, you know, I think that's all the questions that we've received thus far, unless anything comes up in these last moments. This is Cliff. Are there any more questions from the audience out there? Well, you could do this like an auction, going once, going twice. All right, we will have another town hall this coming Saturday. So we'll have an opportunity for people to participate in that town hall. If you wanna join us again, join us on Saturday at 1 p.m. Um, and uh, we'll have many more after that as well. And this is Katie, you know, if you have any further questions, reach out to us, we'll answer, and we'll um, copy any um, um, of your questions into katieq at gmail.com. Uh, Odie Allen said um, that is the goal to achieve licensure or are you only focusing on accepting certifications, new certifications. Uh, this is Cliff, just recognizing interpreter certifications for now, yes. Michelle Hoekland said, thank you. And Susan Brown, Brown said, thank you so much for all of this information it has been very informative. I appreciate all of your hard work. Thank you. Nodi said thank you. Stacy Nichols said great town hall. Thank you. And no, I guess there's just more thank yous. That's it. That's it. Uh, Sarah added that I like the idea of Utah's assessment.
Nala said, thank you for all of your hard work and all the work that still to come. The options sound good. And I think that's it. I think everyone else is pretty much saying thank you. Oh, I guess there's one more question that just popped up. And uh, this is also anonymous. Will you be sending out another survey or was that survey um, meeting what you needed to look for for Colorado? This is Cliff. I guess the question is really to you. Um, should we do another survey? Uh, and how will that survey help if we did? The commission asked me and John to search out options for various other certifications. We sent out our surveys and got our responses and our recommendations based on you know, what the commission wanted. And I think that we filled that box and we passed this back to the commission uh, based on what you had requested us to do. And another person uh, said, um, can we get John's email address? So would you mind entering that, John? Sure, that's fine. And I'm seeing nothing else. Um, I'll make sure that we get John's email added. John, can you type in your email? This is Cliff. Yeah, I'll get it in there. And you and Katie's saying you can see his email in the chat. I um, already typed it, but I think I typed it in wrong. I think I, I, I typed Trish's. Oh, email. <laughs> and, and Katie's saying, you know, when I, when I email you, Trish, you know, it just comes automatically. But when I email John, I always have to double check it. This is okay. I, I'm not seeing anything else. I think we're good, but Odie just wanted also. Uh, stress that she wanted to thank the interpreters and also thanks to CART services too. In Q&A, I don't see John's email and so um, I'm recommending you take a look at the chat box, but you know what, I'll enter it in the Q&A spot as well. So yeah, I just entered John's email in the Q&A spot. Okay. This is Cliff. At the beginning of our conversation with the community, uh, we started this discussion. I think it's important for us to continue to have an open dialogue with the community about certification, recognizing certification. So thank you so much. I appreciate your time joining us for this town hall. And with that, I look forward to seeing you next time. Um, so if there are any other questions, um, please um, send us your, your email addresses. Sounds good. So again, um, we will, we together as a community have a lot of work ahead of us. It's not a commission thing. This is a community thing. So I'll talk with you all next time. And I think it's bedtime for me, at least where I am right now. <laughs> it's bedtime. <laughs> so good night, everyone. Bye. And thank you for joining us on this town hall. Appreciate it. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Linda and Jolinda.